again hesitant to speak about Bach interpretation. Curiously enough, I feel more hesitant than when it comes to perform or record these pieces. Even as I'm conscious that both my actual performance and my understanding of the score and knowledge about performance practice will keep evolving throughout my life as a performer, I'm aware of the limitations of words when it comes to music. Like many of you, I grew up listening to the old masters we all admire, Sherwin, Heifetz, Arthur Brumiot, Milstein, Sigeti, Sure, let's include Perlman. Over 20 years ago, when I moved from Argentina to Freiburg in Germany, I was inspired by Baroque musicians. To my surprise back then, extremely undogmatic ones, such as Robert Hill, who you're listening right now, the Freiburg Baroque Orchestra, Anton Steck, the leader of Music Antigua Köln, and later in Toronto by Jean Le Bon, the concert master of Tafel Music, former concert master. been exposed to the HIP, Historically Informed Performance Movement, a movement that maybe had started as a way to rethink the narrative of the past and to correct excesses on an overrated placement of value on the artist's own ex personal expression, a reaction against invented tradition and a movement that arguably at times also invented traditions of their own, a movement that now takes on classical and romantic repertoire. Back then I started reading more historical sources, listening to more HIP performances, and I experimented with a Baroque setup. I wanted to know more about historically informed performance practice, but only to inspire my interpretation and to share with my students and spark their curiosity as they develop their own interpretation. And yet, trying to come up with any advice from my students is terribly difficult. Bach did not write anything about how to perform his own works. 
we need to rely on contemporaries, friends, relatives and students to try to understand the significance of the symbols and the technical and stylistic issues in these works with the goal of capturing the composer's intention and the affect of the music. We have to accept that there is a lot of guesswork here. We don't know exactly if the treatise is applied specifically to Bach, nor to these works in particular. The perception of the authors of those treatises is also subjective and conditioned by time and location. Baroque and Galant styles overlapped in time. There was the French, the Italian, and the German amalgam styles. And the interpretation of those treatises writings by us is also subjective. Most of our interpretation and reasoning might be ultimately personal taste. Every performance back then and today, even by the same performer, would be different each time. There are so many things that I don't know, and the more I read, the more I know that I know nothing. Socrates' phrase, however cliché, genuinely might apply here, and yet, ironically in this context, Socrates himself was never recorded saying it. Socrates made no writings. He's known mainly through the accounts of classical writer, writers writing after his lifetime. The original phrase might have been closer to this. Many scholars believe that in some works, Plato, being a literary artist, pushed his writing up version of Socrates far beyond anything the historical Socrates was li likely to have done or said, which brings us back to our point. Reconstructing a historical and philosophical image based on the variable and sometimes contradictory nature of the existing sources of his life is the Socratic problem we encounter also in Bach interpretation. But at the end of the day, the question for me as an interpreter was and still is, what will I do in my performance? And to my students, what will you do? Well, it's complicated and we are alone against the challenge. Yet, while acknowledging the immense amount of information and responsibility, we mustn't become paralyzed. A concertmaster of one of Germany's top orchestras once told me that he stopped playing and teaching back because of the conflict and contradictions between the opposing trends in performance practice. Many students I meet lack the knowledge and the background that can inspire them in approaching these pieces. They don't find the time to dive deep into musicology books and treatises. It's terribly difficult for me as well. My recording of Bach follows my attempts at large and complete opuses by Mozart, Schubert, and Piazzolla with humble attempts in background research. As much as we try, it is difficult in practice to specialize in the performance of everything. And at the same time, it's too sad to narrow our focus too much and not the best solution just to be ignorant. So how do I avoid paralysis? How do I reconcile my appreciation of different performance styles? How do I live with the contradictions and the things that we will never know without resorting to, out of ignorance, the naivete to do whatever I want? How do I circle around the fact that we tend to like whatever we are used to? I would like to share a brief summary of my own present struggles, questions and views on some of the many layers of performance and study of these works. I ask for your awareness that any affirmative and short sentences are not intended to be dogmas. They will be used here for the sake of summarizing and moving ahead in a timely manner, and with the understanding that many of these topics are much deeper, mostly unresolved, and can ultimately be solved only by each of you in performance, not to mention differently every time. The symbols that we see on Bach's score cannot be read as a MIDI file. In the following 50 slides or so, we will see how what we see on the page doesn't necessarily mean what it looks like. And that's on, not only because we are so musical. In 1720, 35 years old Kapellmeister Johann Sebastian Bach was enjoying the best conditions for writing he would ever experience. His employer, Prince Leopold, was a Calvinist who required secular and mainly instrumental music. During this time, 
Bach was able to write many of his famed keyboard, instrumental, and orchestral masterpieces. While Bach's career seemed to be thriving, significant tragedy befell his personal and family life. While accompanying Prince Leopold on a journey to Karlsbad in the summer of 1720, Bach's wife, Maria Barbara, fell ill and died before Bach had a chance, a chance to return home. Even at a time when sudden death was common, this event was presumed to be a catastrophic blow to Bach and his four children. Despite this, whatever difficulties Bach may have been experiencing did not keep him from refining and completing his compositions for single and accompanied string instruments. The reasons for these works are unclear. Although the Italian title, literally, You're Alone, suggests to some fanciful imaginations that the collection may be a homage to Maria Barbara, Bach's wife, more likely the title spelling is simply erroneous and he meant to write Sei Soli, Six Solos. For practical purposes, I used the Bern Writer edition and complemented it with the facsimile of Bach's autograph. There's nothing like looking at the autograph. So many details like the customary writing of the stems of each single note, even in the chords, the authentic titles, the motion and direction of Bach's beautiful and inspiring handwriting, the ambiguity of the samplers, and more terrestrially speaking, some mistakes that can be found even in the Baron Writer edition. Here you can see a couple of examples of the kind of mistakes or differences that can be found between the Baron Writer and the autograph, and you can see the duration of the slurs and where they start. This table displays a list of sources. In this slide are sources that are probably more important for Bach interpretation. But there are many things to take into consideration. For example, Leopold Mozart's famous treatise might refer rather to the new Galan style that was emerging. And here are more sources. Muffat and Couperin's apply more specifically to French music rather than Bach. We should also consider that C.P. Bach, while being Bach's son, had a different style to the one of his father and what he wrote about music might not necessarily directly affect interpretation of Johann Sebastian's music. I chose to record my album of Bach sonatas and partitas with a baroque bow. Before doing this recorded, recording, I had experimented for the last 20 years, switching back and forth between a baroque bow and my more modern sartorial bow from around 1893. Back in 2012, after listening to the sound samples when I was preparing for a previous recording of Bach sonata in C major, I decided which bow to use. I enjoyed the expressive potential of the Baroque bow, the transparent texture, and the effortlessness with which it went around the curves, changing strings and directions with ease. The ability to differentiate subtle nuances at the beginning and end of each stroke, and the subsequent numerous possibilities. The Baroque bow naturally helped interpret the music and avoid wrong accents in this repertoire. Furthermore, it allowed for a lighter sound quicker, more flowing tempo, and lively articulations. Since then, I have played Bach say solo with a Baroque bow. For me, the Baroque bow feels ideally appropriate, as it informs us constantly about the sound, articulation, and character. It is also, together with a Baroque violin setup, the most, if not the only, objective element in an HIP performance. And there are not too many good excuses, not at least to try one. They are cheaper than your usual repair. <laughs> so what does the Baroque bow teach us? In my experience, it shows us that up bow and down bow don't need to sound the same. It tells us that, that sustained, continuous sound doesn't come naturally. It also demonstrates that rhythmic articulation, clarity, and playing fast is easy in the lower half of the bow, that pressure doesn't help at all, and that there is resonance between the notes. 
In terms of sounds, it's very interesting to see what different composers and writers from the time tell us. Ludwig uh, Leopold Mozart speaks about the absence of the Viking attack, producing notes beautifully and touchingly, leading the bow from strong to weak. Singing a round and fat tone. Geminiani, Panzer, Agricola, and North all speak about the mesa di voce, the swelling or increasing and softening of the sound. The biting attack was another innovation of the 19th century as a means to getting louder and more brilliant sound. And we have to remember that the host during all this period changed, so the necessity of us to produce sound in ever larger holes also changed and is affected from both ways. In this piece, is, in this piece is, there is an immense amount of repeated string crossings, many times skipping over one or two strings. In my opinion, those string crosses don't need to be avoided with elaborate fingerings. The Baroque bow makes it easy and natural to play, so that there is no need whatsoever to avoid them. This helps at the same time to stay in lower positions where the strings are longer, more resonant, and in keeping patterns in the quiet sequences and differentiation in the hidden voices that happen simultaneously between the different strings. The written slurs in Bach are most probably bowings and articulation ones. They influence accents and delineate the contrapuntal structure, the dynamic shading, a baroque bow and fluent tempi can help realize most of the bowings. I always start from the original. Bach was a very good violinist. His son, Carl Philipp Emanuel, would recall from his youth up to a fairly old age, he played the violin purely and with a penetrating tone, and thus kept the orchestra in top form, much better than he could have from the harpsichord. He completely understood the possibilities of all string instruments. Those are Carl Philipp Emanuel's words about his father. The slurs, the slurs constitute also 30% of the explicit information that Bach gives us in the text. So I see little reasoning, not at least to try hardly the original voice. And having said so, yes, sure, I change here and there myself some voice at the end of the day. There are very few dynamic indications, often echoes in these pieces. It is possible that categories of loud and soft were not as significant. The music might not depend or need wide dynamic differences and indefinitely immense varieties of color. Small difference surface, it's more about the character, sound, tonality, articulation, agoric freedom as means of expressions and accents. In other words, I don't write crescendi and diminuendo in my score to help Bach's music. I think this music lives from other variables. There are so many ways to play the chords. Let's start by saying that the notes in the chords don't need to be played simultaneously nor literally, literally sustained. We have to be aware of the rhythmic that can be created when we break a chord. I mainly use the different ways of arpeggiated road chords. They can be downbow or upbow. I never roll the chord from top to bottom or go from the bottom to the top and back again. That was a resource that was used widely 50 years ago and still a lot of people use it to denotate and make clear a specific voice. Though I try to trust the score and try to trust the listener that they will be able to remember an important voice that I just play and I don't need to repeat the note going back to the bass, which would create a very weird rhythmic pattern that is not intended or written in the music. I try to give a lot of prominence to the bass. We all know that in Baroque it's all about the bass and it projects less well than higher strings, so it's difficult to overstate. It's enough to suggest, make the listener believe instead of literally holding the complete value of every single note. 
Make believe is an essential ingredient of a rock art, architecture, and theater. Besides the length, we can also help the independence of the voices with dynamic differences. In, um, for example, in Bach uh, and Dante of the A minor, we can shorten the notes of the bass line and punctuate them to make the voice clear and more easily identifiable than the soprano. So even when they look to be the same, you don't need to sustain them the same length. In moto perpetual movements, we can elongate or accent notes to bring up different voices and make the appearances of continuation of voices that are not really sustained, which means that when we see all the notes with the same value on the page, eh, that doesn't mean that it needs to sound like a solo machine. So why did, didn't I use a baroque setup for my recording in terms of the violin? Some considerations about the many variables in Bach's times are appropriate here. Wound gut strings already existed in Bach's times and the frequency of the A varied widely. There is not one historical pitch. The tuning fork was invented in 1711, but you could only say that a tone was higher or lower. There were no machines to measure that difference. Um, using the tone or half tone as a unit of measure is inaccurate due to the varying temperaments. Also, pitch fluctuates in organs and wind instruments due to changes in temperature and wind pressure. The difference between the summer and winter pitches could be a half tone. And pitch standards also varied in each country. Even in nearby cities, different pitches were coexistent. The fact is that the same note names were applied to different pitches on different instruments and none of the implied standards was any more real than the other. There was something called coaton, that was the ecclesiast ecclesiastical pitch to which organs were usually tuned, and that was between 4, 460 and 489 hertz. There was the chamber pitch, camaton, and there, were, there was a, a high and low camaton. The difference between those was could be a whole tone to a minor third. The A played by the strings in Leipzig, according to different studies, was either 440 or 460. In Köthen, where Bach wrote these works, the quaton and the Kamaton might have been the same. And we suppose this because in many other places there were two different scores, one for the the organ choir, one for the strings, and that tells us that the difference of those, and there was nothing like that found in curtain. In this sense, regular reproduction of a fixed average historical chamber pitch is an invented tradition, and it's not really historical, so it's equally wrong to play everything at 420 as it is to play it always at 440 or 460. I do enjoy the sound, softness, and open reverberation of the gut strings. I, like how, I love how the E string doesn't shout and how the strings constantly remind us that pressing or digging is not a good idea. However, I so, have sort of perfect pitch and unfortunately, if I were to play these pieces at the, act, at the actually not even settled A415, they would sound to me as if they were in another key. I have huge respect to musicians that master gut strings, and I acknowledge the convenience in maintaining the pitch with modern strings. For my recording, I use synthetic strings that were slightly softer and more resonance than I usually use otherwise. Intonation is also very complicated. There are many tuning systems to choose from, and there is not a perfect one. Which of the following should we try to go for? The problem has to do with the eternal paradox of the fifth and the third. It's not possible to have it all in one system, nice fifths and nice thirds. Pure, non-beating intervals, 
like unisons X, fifth, fourth, cannot be combined freely if we have some fixed pitches. If we stack five pure thirds, let's say C to A, C to E, so C, G, D, A, E, the resulting major third is higher than the pure third. In Pythagorean intonation, the fifths are pure. The thirds are complex and comparably much more dissonant. By the way, we also only know about Pythagorean tuning through Plato's writing, not directly through Pythagoras. In quarter comma mean tone, each fifth is diminished and the thirds are pure. Just intonation is a result of the overtone series. All the notes use pure intervals. The major third in a pure major chord is a comma low and the minor third a comma high. The pitch changes along the performance depending on the key. It's also a problem because in the violin we have four fixed pitches in the open strings and we use the open strings a lot in these pieces. We lose the sympathetic resonance and we don't match horizontally when we play those notes again. Also the melodic intervals are compromised and sound awkward. So in that case, we are preferencing vertical instead of horizontal intonation. Equal temperament makes a compromise, dividing the difference equally in each interval. And here is yet another temperament. Bradley Lemon interpreting Bach's well-tempered clavier notation in the picture above reconstructs this temperament. And there are still many other temperaments. At the end of the day, we have to choose the one that we favor without forgetting the human factor. We need to play these down pieces. I actually like starting from Pythagorean intonation respecting pure fifths and fourths that resonate and are congruent with our open strings, using tight leading tones, even exaggerating those in fast movements, and rounding up thirds and sixths intuitively when needed in chords. But it's not necessary to choose one system or another. We don't need a fixed pitch, pitched system. And once our ears and understanding of harmonies develop, we can intuitively adapt to what we are looking for. Meaning, you could choose a different intonation in, in a repeat to bring a particular characteristic that you are interested in. Uh, if you want to bring a melody or, a, or the harmonic context more to the foreground. I always encourage my students to expand their options, consulting multiple sources and observing that all, what other violinists are doing. There are plenty of ideas there. Rachel Barton Pine sharing, Edition Peters, International Music Company. But I also emphasize that it's a good idea to sometimes start from scratch. I usually only share my fingerings, mostly for curiosity's sake, after my students have performed, have formed their own ideas. Fingerings are part of our interpretation. Most of my fingerings differ from the last time I played these pieces and they will keep evolving. They reflect our individual state of understanding that solo players seek to play everything when possible on one string in order to produce consistently the same quality. But again, let's don't forget that Leopold Mozart was writing for the newer Galant uh, style. And the idea of creating chorus by staying in only one string is comes later on in music for the most part. Still, we have in Bibal uh, sometimes indications to Lil Cantino where he specifically asks to stay in one string for a particular melody. And also, using lower positions, it helps us to bring a lot in the sort of motor perpetual movement those. Uh, voices in the G and E that are sort of popping out uh, and bring those soprano and bass lines more to the foreground. Vibrato was available as a sort of ornament to the sound. <laughs> it was, who's that? <laughs> Vibrato was available as a sort of ornament to the sound, imitating the voice, 
not as a standard addition to every note nor altering the pitch. And you can see some quotes in the screen. Leopold Mozart and Paganini were against continuous vibrato. I use it to warm up long notes. It can also be used in a hardly noticeable way that is compatible with the sound of open strings. I avoid a vibrato that brings attention to itself. I try to avoid pitch variation or a mon monotonous speed in the vibrato or monotonous amplitude. <laughs> They are also called good and bad or principal and passing notes. In a moderate tempo or even in an adagio, even though they appear to have the same value, they must be placed somewhat unevenly. And the metric accent is something that I have been speaking quite a lot in sectionals. It's that idea of the one, two, three, four, the different importance of the beats in the bar. Strong, less, maybe more, less. And that's something that uh, all practices pretty much speak about, that main architecture. And um, obviously there can be directions, there can be sometimes dynamics, but that basic structure permeates Baroque, classical, and classically inspired romantic music and thinking about Mendelssohn, Schumann, Brahms. Apart from ornamentation, the most noticeable aspect of French performance is the practice of rhythmic inequality. This was ordinary, an ordinary form in French dance. It is usual to lengthen the notes on the beat and shorten the notes of the beat, though the opposite, the Lombardic rhythm with a short note on the beat is also possible, the Lombardic rhythm being param, param, and an notes, uh, notes, eighth notes played with inequality would be pa, pa, when written, actually the same. 
the more sophisticated the music, the more subtle and varied the inequality was. The important thing is that the decorative note value should be flexible. Most French dance music was played at a brisk tempo, thus eliminating the inequality procedure. And we have to remember that Bach was a German composer, so he might have been aware of the practice. French music musicians may have performed his music considering inequality, but it's a point of debate how much of this affects directly the music of Johann Sebastian Bach. Also, how different, or how do we say, if the difference in times that we're hearing is part of tempo rubato, of the good or passing tones that we spoke in the previous slide, or if of inegalité. There is no firm evidence that Bach himself made use of inequality. But Bach may have in the red indirectly known of inequality, especially through his contact with Dresden during 1730. In the art of the field, which contained dotted rims throughout, is an exceptional instance wherein Bach may have sought to approximate the French style of inequality. discussion whether the dotted note should be extended. Alterations differ from place to place, from style to style, and from generation to generation. Bach knew of the practice and even, even added over Dotty when he rewrote his keyboard overture Bach Berkefer Zeichnis 831. Johann Philipp Kirchberger, who studied composition with Bach around 1740, advocates overdotting of overtures and rules. And, um, and, but he states that caution might is needed in applying these practices to Bach music. I like using a degree of improvisatory freedom in the treatment of the dotted rhythms. Rechlach, Couperin, Beishlach, and Quantz mentioned that in many cases, in order to sharpen the rhythm, the dotted note is not lengthened, but a pause is interpolated instead. And there you can see how that would look like if you had a little bit of a pause instead of lengthening the actual uh, note. Quantz, as well as CPE Bach, have made the point that the turn following a, sorry, a trill should be executed at the same speed of the trill itself. Rhythmic assimilation refers to the coordination of dotted eighth notes or sixteenth notes with a triplet. And that was not deemed appropriate by Bach, except in rapid passages, according to one of Bach's pupils, Agricola. The reasoning behind this is to re retain the distinctiveness of the different rhythms. The only occasions where this is deemed acceptable is when the tempo is really fast and it's very difficult uh, to notice the difference in those cases those can be assimilated, and that's, there's a good example of how it would be if it is assimilated in the second line.
Bach scores are very detailed, melodically and harmonically, almost impossibly dense and complex in their rhythmic patterns, possibly documents of Bach's own improvisations. The first movement of Sonata 1 and 2 are clear examples of how in Bach we find many improvisations written out and we might not necessarily require to add ornaments of our own, though this music can certainly tolerate ornaments. I do add cadential trills here and there, and the ornamentation can also take the form of additional slurs, rhythmic logic, rhythmic inequality, and notes in egals. The improvisation of cadences was not added in constant sixteenth or eighth notes in the music. Cooper and C.P. Bach, Jean Rousseau and Rossi state that ornaments are needed and appropriate for expression but should not be exaggerated. Bach seems to write all these ornaments as notes in these words. You see there a table that Bach gave to his son, and we never see in Bach's music um, the, kind, the kind of writing that you see in the upper uh, notation. So we see the translated version in, in the scores, rather. Um, so that would tend to lead us that Bach did write his own improvisations and ornaments. Also, a typical exercise is to start crossing passing notes or little scales between structural notes and then uh, getting an idea of the structure of the music and then we can see how much Bach already added in comparison to his contemporaries. Trills should be played on the beat and for the most part from the upper note. But there are exceptions. If approached from, the, from a step above, they will be played on the main note in fast tempi and sometimes we want to delineate a particular melody and playing the trills from the upper note would change the, the, the way that we want to display that melody and in those cases I think it's very appropriate to, to choose to start from the note. Um, the trills endings are often written out in Bach's music. In French music, a trill on a long note is started slowly and then speed in a soon as, and then speed is increased. Appoggiaturas can make a great contribution. They are necessary elements. Long appoggiaturas are strong and they have from the following note. Short appoggiaturas can be soft and before the beat. Appoggiaturas are mostly written out in these words as notes. Only a couple are written as Grace notes. And we can see here how Bach writes um, an appoggiatura and how tricky it is sometimes because we have an appoggiatura and then a trill, so we are starting the trill from the note above that's already actually the appoggiatura. Does it make sense? Uh, so that's, those are some of the decisions that we have to make. And here's a way in a typical place where I would add a cadential trill to the music. Going on to numerology, number symbolism is found in pre-Bach composers. Bach probably read the writings of Andreas Regmeister, and we can see a lot of math that he included in his music. For example, a lot of times we see special features in the number 14, in a bar 14, and 14 is the addition of BACH, 2138, or also we see interesting features in measures 41, which is the inverse of 14, and the addition of JS Bach, uh, if we assign a number to each letter. And I, I have seen big books speaking about religious connotations and mathematical uh, formulas that seem to appear in some of his works and it's difficult to know if those were thought or by Bach or just by the authors of those books. But then we have to think how much do those affect us as 
interpreters and how much of that any audience could perceive is subjectively or objectively. And following now to the doctrine of affections. German affected letter theory, theory of musical aesthetics was widely accepted by late Baroque theorists. It basically stated that music is capable of arousing a variety of specific emotions within the listener. The devices were rigorously catalogued and described by such 17th and 18th century theories as Kircher, Breckmeister, Heineken, and Johann Matheson. Many of Bach's movements adhere to the idea of one affect per movement. A lot of times we have a few, we have a dance inspired movement that is just one mood for the whole movement. But we could discuss if, let's say, Bach Chacon goes through different affects through the 10 minutes duration. And that goes a little bit along of my idea that when we are playing Bach, we, it's not so much about creating different colors describing a specific story or landscape, like when, like a dance movement. It's, it lives from something else, and it arguably might be romanticizing or bringing something from a different era to want to put something different in this music. several even note passages in the Adagio in a distinctly uneven ma manner. So is he doing tempo rubato? Is that tempo rubato baroquely inspired or is it sort of the more modern romantic music? He uses very little vibrato though he was the teacher of our and our was the teacher of my gener uh, of the teachers of my generation. Uh, so what happened in the meantime, because uh, one generation ago, or a little bit more, everyone was teaching us vibrato on every single note, but uh, Joachim, teacher of the teacher of them, was not doing it. And uh, that goes along the line of what's happening with fashions, traditions that we learn, that we teach. And let's don't forget that Bach's music stopped being performed for 100 years until the revival by Mendelssohn and Schumann. So there were a few generations that were not actively playing and passing oral tradition about performance practices in this music. It, also, it is also important to point out that the word interpretation in relation to music performance only started being used about 1840. In his article, Beyond the Interpretation of Music, Lawrence Dreyfus explored its meaning and how different composers and performers held divergent opinions on the role of the performer. You can see in the table some of very important musicians' thoughts about what we as interpreters are supposed to do or what our role in the process is and that touches very directly to everything that we are talking now.
and you see how they change from literally playing exactly what's on the page to trying to reincarnate what the composer want to later on partner an hour speaking of metaphysical things such as empathy and reveal a, the spirit of the music. So how, how can we tell if someone is representing more the spirit of the music than any other person? It, it becomes really subjective and completely different um, guidance of, on what a performer is supposed to do. And I actually can relate to many of these completely different ideas at the same time. Also, the circumstances of a recording influence our performance. We have to adapt to the halls that we are playing in, and the very fact of recording these pieces goes against any idea of historical interpretation. There was nothing like that back then. Also, the fact that our recording can be listened every many times again affects the way, because if you're doing an improvisation that is supposed to be valid only for the moment, reflecting what you feel, and then in a recording you hear it many times, you might get tired of those added notes. And we didn't even speak yet about the big authority of the dead composer. We are even more intrigued and mysticized by the fact that there is so much we don't know and out of reverence to the authority of the dead genius composer. I shared some of my ideas here. So we have all this respect to that genius composer. What, at what time do we as interpreters take authority? So going back to where we started, what is my approach? Is this an informed, historically informed performance? stand for one of these. Is this a hybrid third generation HIV? Is this cultural appropriation? One answer that might give a bit of solace can be found in the article analyzing the difference in recordings of wax violin solos with a lead from Gilles Deleuze. Dorothea Fabian describes the ideas of three categories of performers and analyzes performance parameters in the recordings of each group. She differentiates according to the three following categories. The Romantic Modernist, the Literalist or Classical Modernist, and Historically Informed Performance. recordings show that hardly any of them fit perfectly 
in the theorized categories. Problems of classification emerge, indicating constantly shifting, transforming, and emerging stylistic territories that mix and match various performance elements in diverse combinations and degrees. Our understanding of style, performance, and performers is enriched by such a non-categorizing approach. Fabian acknowledges that we, as well as the artworks, are multiplicities, and comes to the conclusion that more than one thing can be true at once, and that there exists a constantly transforming process. My interpretation cannot be authentic, nor does it attempt to be. There doesn't need to be a divide between the musicians who adhere to HFP and the ones who identify as modern players. Putting our interpretation into a box and labeling it is problematic. It's a long journey. I stand by the idea that our interpretation changes along the way. The curiosity as inspiration and the lifelong learning is what hopefully remains constant and what I, what I try to pass on to my students. You know, who, who's the judge? You can... 
it's, it's difficult to say who's the judge, but I think it, it was valid in, in, in those times and, and the what being what you're playing and, and, your, uh, and how is, is your approach. So I, I think it's who cares what I think, right? But I don't see any problem. Any other question or controversy? Okay, let's hear some live music.
going to be like anything new that we do weird when when you ask how are you doing we are so conditioned for example if I ask you to take notice of the sound right now of the AC tell me how many of you had thought during today that you had heard that so one two three people four five yeah um, so what what is when you say how are you feeling or how does it feel we are conditioned to what we are used to and that happens too with aesthetic uh, with physicalities of course but a lot of times when we are asked how, how do you like that performance or that other besides some standards of intonation when the aesthetic is conditioned back to what we are used to and when you try this ball, I have no idea what's going to go on, but it's going to be different than this, that's for sure.
realize that in difference to your goal, even if you try very hard, you cannot make the goal go like this. Yes, sir. And when you play it, a lot of times when you did in the belly of your top style ball, this, your intonation is like ah or ah, yes? That's what's happening, the pitch is changing. So independently of your approach, I would suggest that you're really aware of what's happening with pitch when you dig into the ball. Yeah, does it, does it make sense? That's what you said, even with this ball, do you try to be, uh, play without this inclination? Do you try to play, the, the, do you try to play without it? Or you Good question. I think I, you know, I'm listening to the sound, everything, everything, like with the modern ball, it's not like I'm a repeater or I'm always with one, one position. Mm -hmm. okay. So, yeah, try it now. You have to do ah, uh, 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 yes, with your hand. Just let it. Yes, you, what, what a uh, typical thing that you're doing is you go towards the feet slower and deeper. Yes, ah, uh, and I, when you're playing with the modern ball, a lot of the chords that you play are para, yes, they do, para. None of this is a problem. The thing that you have to be aware of is that when you do that, you're doing para, so you're clearly creating a rhythm. Ata. Yes? It's tough. Yeah. So, why don't you try once a possibility where the change is not so distinctive. Does it make sense? Or you're not creating a rhythm that is, could be so easily helped by. And uh, try to avoid the, the idea of But 
you have to ask, is that a dog? Do I have to do that? Do I have to do from that? Does it need to sound exactly with the same way as the downbow? Imagine that you have not yet. piece but it's part of a 25 minute piece which is part of a work of two hours roughly so you don't get lost in the middle of the 10 seconds phrase does it make sense yeah. so that we get a sense of the structure Don't sustain. Don't sustain. 
section typically everyone says, oh no, I'm going to make a beautiful color like light, bluish with violet, or I remember when I was a child and it was so tender with this. Sure, but it, the dance continues. <laughs> <laughs> from the teacher of our, of our teacher or the uncle of the it's just keep playing in with me. from 
violence that we all admire, but is is not like that. <laughs> Yeah. Bravo. Thank you. 